Welcome to this short lecture on portal hypertension. This particular mini lecture will cover the definition, so what is portal hypertension? The anatomy, so the, the normal hepatic portal venous system. The causes, so what kind of things would lead to portal hypertension. The pathophysiology, how it manifests. And then finally, the complications associated with it. So let's start off with a definition. So the portal hepatic system is essentially a venous system that drains all of the gastrointestinal tract and some of the other viscera in the abdomen. So this is really draining everything from the esophagus all the way down to the proximal two-thirds of the rectum. So all that associated intestines, stomach, spleen, pancreas, etc., all the way up to parts of the esophagus will drain venously, so everything that you eat and consume will get drained and brought into the liver for processing through this portal system. And so this portal system, because it is a venous system, it has, com compared to an artery system, a very, very low pressure. And so the reason for that is, within the liver itself, it uses a sinusoidal venous system. So this is a very slow ebb and flow kind of system that kind of moves blood in through these vessels and they have these fenestrations in the blood vessels which allow blood to kind of perfuse out of the veins into the cells or the hepatocytes of the liver. And that allows the processing of plasma, proteins, most of the const constituents of the blood except the, the blood cells like red blood cells and white blood cells. So everything can flow through. And then once the liver's happy with it, because remember, anything that you eat potentially could be toxic or dangerous. So one of the jobs of the liver is to get all that blood, send it through the liver, process it, make sure it's okay. And then once it's happy, it will put its blood into the inferior vena cava, which then will go up into the heart and it goes all over the body. So therefore, for this system to work, it really needs to be under a low pressure. So we're looking at only a blood pressure of five to six millimeters of mercury. So what happens is when this pressure builds up, you know, above six, moving in towards 10 millimeters of mercury, we develop portal hypertension. And so that's essentially the definition. It's when you get a higher blood pressure than what it should be, between 5 and 6, that builds up, let's say, approaching 10, and if that's in this venous system, that is portal hypertension. Now, we will cover the causes of that in a second, but firstly, just let's just have a look at the anatomy. So the portal vein is the venous drainage of the gut, which will move into the liver. Now it approaches the liver from behind and goes into the hilum of the liver, which we call the portal hepatis. It approaches that and brings two thirds of the blood into the liver in conjunction with the hepatic proper artery. So the blood will come in. Now what it's draining is essentially all the different parts of the gut. And so it has a number of important branches that we will now cover. So the first kind of branch that we will have a look at is the left gastric vein. And that drains part of the esophagus and the lesser curvature of the stomach and certain superior aspects of the cardia of the stomach, etc. So that's the lesser, or sorry, that's the left gastric vein, left gastric vein. The next vein, as we move kind of distally, we have the splenic vein. And you could probably guess what that vein is going to be draining. It's going to be draining the spleen. It's going to be draining the greater curvature of the stomach. And it's going to be draining the pancreas. And that's now coming in to, to form, again, the portal system. Moving down to this particular artery, or this particular vein, this is the inferior mesenteric vein. And this is going to drain, coming right down towards the end of the elementary canal or the GIT and that's going to drain the two-thirds, proximal two-thirds of the rectum and the rectal canal moving into the sigmoid colon, up in the, in the descending colon and then we do the splenic flexure and we come to a bit of the transverse colon. So all of that 
bowel is drained by the inferior mesenteric vein. And then finally we move to the rest of the bowel, which is done by the superior mesenteric vein. And that's going to drain most of the small intestines coming into the cecum, into the ascending large bowel, the hepatic flexure, and probably two thirds of the transverse colon. And that's drained by the superior meson mesenteric vein. So the superior mesenteric, the inferior mesenteric, the splenic, and the less left gastric vein all converge, all confluences into the portal vein to drain into the liver at a pressure of five to six millimeters of mercury. So you could imagine what would happen if you had some kind of abnormality in that drainage system. And so this is where we come into the causes. What causes these hypertension? What causes this hypertension? And so I'll put this in, I'll change colour, I'll put this in green. We have what we call a pre-hepatic. We have intra-hepatic. And we have post-hepatic causes. So these are the three main causes of portal hypertension. Prehepatic, intrahepatic, posthepatic. So these are anything before it comes into the liver is going, in terms of dysfunction is going to be prehepatic. Anything within the liver itself is going to be intrahepatic, and anything outside the liver, so either the the left and right hepatic vein or from the inferior vena cava onwards, is going to be posthepatic vein. Now, by far and away, the most common cause of it is the intrahepatic causes. And so approximately 90%, if not more, are causes within this particular type. But let's go through it one at a time. So the prehepatic causes aren't that, very, aren't that common. And so anything to do with things that will slow down the flow or block the flow moving into the liver will be a prehepatic causes. So this could be certain congenital abnormalities in the vein itself where it's got atresia or um, restriction in flow. That could cause portal hypertension as it flows in towards the portal system. Or you could have certain thrombosis. So you could have blockages here in the splenic vein or you could have blockages more in the portal vein. So this is, could be a, a thrombosis, like a deep vein thrombosis, but in this case it's the portal vein. So it could be a portal one, or a splenic one, or maybe another one somewhere else. Another cause could be potentially in paediatrics is uh, Wil Wilms tuner, which is in the kidney, and that can push up on one of these vessels, which could also cause portal hypertension. So that's the pre-hepatic causes. As I said, it's not that common, but there are some examples of how it could potentially occur. Moving to the intrahepatic causes. This is essentially where within the liver itself, as we spoke about, you have those sinusoids, you have the fenestrations within the vessels to allow blood to just slowly percolate through the liver, be processed by the hepatocytes, and then put into the inferior vena cava. Any issue with the liver itself is going to stop that. So by far and away, the biggest cause of the intrahepatic causes is cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is like a stone-like liver. So it's a fibrotic liver. So if all this liver becomes fibrotic, it's going to not allow the blood to flow through and get processed and put into the inferior vena cava. So it's going to back, 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 back into that system. And that's the most common cause of the intrahepatic causes. So cirrhosis, such as alcoholic cirrhosis, is a common cause of portal hypertension. Another common one for the intrahepatic is going to be hepatitis. So that's a virus causing changes, inflammation in the liver, which could then lead to scarring and then similar to the cirrhosis. Finally, we move to the post-hepatic causes, and this is generally to do with the outflow. So you could have potentially, again, a constriction or a blockage within the left or right hepatic vein draining into the IVC, 
or you could have pressure coming back down on the, on the IVC, such found in pregnancy, or if it's coming from the heart itself, so if you've got right-sided heart failure, it's going to push it back, which is going to slow the flow through, or constricted pericarditis is another cause. So these are the causes, we've got the pre, the intra, and the post-hepatic causes of portal hypertension. So what happens now, regardless of the cause, what happens now if we have an, an increased um, pressure, venous pressure in that system? Well, the flow through into the liver is going to be diminished. So the blood will essentially back up. So let's just assume the pressure is happening from above. So all the vessels are equally pressurised. So blood is going to go back into the left gastric vein, it's going to go back into the splenic vein, it's going to go back down into the inferior mesenteric vein, and it's going to go back down into the superior mesenteric vein. So the blood is going to be difficultly drained from these organs, so the body will try and bypass the need to go to the liver. So they'll form alternative routes. And so what starts to happen, just like varicose veins in your legs when they become pressurised, a similar thing starts to occur here. So we have collateral branches which are coming, draining from the splenic, but can also be going back to, say, the stomach and the esophagus. So that will start to dilate and accumulate all around the esophagus and the top part of the stomach because that's trying to get blood back in because ultimately that can drain back into on the left side the hemiozygous vein and on the right side into the ozygous vein. So essentially blood in this system and in the splenic system could find alternative routes through this plexus and back up into the hemiozygous vein, back up into the superior vena cava or into the zygous vein back into the superior vena cava. But in this circumstance, what happens is as the blood's trying to get back into the systemic circulation to bypass the need to go to the liver, it causes varicoses in that area. So we start to see varicoses, like varicose veins, in that area. And that's what that plexus of varicoses is called the periesophageal plexus and causes very dilated blood vessels in the esophagus. And that poses a risk of rupture, and that's one of the most common causes of bleeding or hemorrhaging in portal hypertension, is those plexuses from the esophagus and the top or the superior part of the stomach becomes engorged with blood, trying to put blood back into there, to put it back into the superior vena cava and it becomes engorged and very risky to rupture. So that's the periesophageal um, plexus. Another thing that can happen is an alternative blood supply can come off the portal. It's always there, but it can come off the portal and come to, towards the umbilicus. So pressure will start to push it towards here like so, and that will push blood to your umbilicus, right there. And so that's going to cause periumbilical shunting. And then what can happen is around the umbilicus, on the outside of your umbilicus, around the umbilicus, will start to kind of put these vessels out like so. And some of these will drain down inferiorly, which will go down into the common iliac vein and some will come and go back up to the top. So that would be through the epigastric, superior epigastric vein, up into the brachiocephalic vein, back into the systemic circulation. And what this looks like is a whole clustering of snakes. And this sign is called kaput medusi. And kaput means head, medusa means of medusa. So medusa was a Greek mythical uh, personality who had snakes in her hair and that's what it appears like, these snake-like engorged vessels that come out of the peri-umbilical region and they can get drained down 
inferiorly and also superiorly in that fashion. <coughs> in, the superior, in the splenic section, a common thing that would occur is it backs into the spleen and so you would just get an enlarged spleen, so splenomegaly, that is a sign of portal hypertension. But another common thing that is likely to occur is the veins that's coming down to drain the top of the rectum through here like so is the superior rectal vein and that will start to be engorged okay but it has a plexus like we saw here that can drain back in to the common iliac vein and that's going to be the middle and inferior rectal vein and so we have a communication there also so there's also going to be similar to what we saw here with the periesophageal varicoses you're going to have varicoses down towards the rectum which are generally known as hemorrhoids whether internal or external so you're going to get the varicoses, varicoses here as the superior rectal vein is trying to anastomose with the middle and inferior rectal veins to put blood back into the common iliac vein to go back into the IVC to go back up into the systemic circulation. So you're going to have other varicoses there and I forgot to mention that's going to be the other area of varicoses. So these are the three main areas of where you will have those varicoses occurring. So that's where this anastomosis is occurring to try and put blood back in the systemic circulation. And that's essentially the pathophysiology. So that's what manifests as a result of one of these causes and we have these common areas of problem. Now finally, what are the complications? Well, if you start to put blood which is draining from the GIT straight back into the systemic circulation and bypass the liver, you're going to pose the risk of not processing the blood safely. So we could have problems with the met metabolic side of things. So the way that the glucose is maintained, so your blood sugar glucose isn't regulated anymore because it's, the liver's not doing its job or blood's going around, so we could develop hyperglycemia. You could also develop problems with the detoxifying aspect of things. So blood that needs to be detoxified just gets put into the systemic blood and it can go to the brain and cause certain abnormalities such as hepatic encephalopathy. That's a, a, a common manifestation with portal hypertension. All the fat processing, so the way that fat is processed with the bile system, but also the fat soluble drugs aren't being maintained. So we can have problems with fat soluble vitamins, etc. We have problems with the way drugs and the kinetics of drugs have worked. And particularly the way that the um, anticoagulants, so the, the way that the clotting factors in the blood isn't being carried out by the liver anymore, so we could have potential bleeding issues. And this will be compounded with things like these varicoses. And so if you have problems clotting and you have these varicoses that are starting to pop up, and if they rupture, we can have a disaster, so a lot of bleeding. And that's probably the most common type of hemorrhage that's going to present. About 30% of people with, uh, with portal hypertension will get those varicoses in that area. Finally, another common thing that would occur with the pulmon with a portal hypertension is similar to what's seen in the pulmonary system. When you have an increase in pulmonary hypertension, you get fluid in the lungs or pulmonary edema. Same thing happens down here. When you have an increase in portal system, you start to have fluid that comes out into the peritoneum. And so all this fluid, because of the increase in hydrostatic pressure, forces blood off into the peritoneum. And this is what we call ascites. And this is where you get the accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal space. And could, in approximately 80% of patients, this will be present. So I think that we'll leave that there. We've covered quite a lot. We've done the definition. We've looked at the anatomy and the way that the blood flows. We've looked at the main causes of portal hypertension, how it manifests, and then finally, what are the complications to the body if this isn't processed properly.